Welcome. Every month, uh, maybe every week, we hear about a cybersecurity breach. Or worse, of how there was data theft. And thousands, millions, hundreds of millions. I read a story, there was a billion uh, details about a billion users was lost, right? Or worse, this data is stolen and held for a ransom, right? You've heard of these stories. I'm, I'm one of those affected ones. This is really scary. The reason this is happening is because attackers are becoming, are using more and more sophisticated attacks. They have started using AI and ML to improve their attacks. It's, it's a serious threat. Uh, at Amazon, uh, security is job zero, right? Uh, we draw, if there is a security issue, we drop everything else and address that. It is also time for, to analyze and see if, um, if how we can enhance, if, if you have partners here, how we can enhance your services or products using AI and ML. Gartner predicts that this is also a good opportunity. Gartner predicts that the cybersecurity space is going to see a growth of about 20% year over year for the next, at least for the next couple of years. So it's a good opportunity to make really good security products. Today, what you'll be seeing is how, as a customer, you can understand how AI and ML can enhance your security, uh, security of your uh, cloud. And if you're use, choosing different partner solutions, how do you choose them? How do you know uh, many claim that they use AI and ML? But how do you know if that uh, implementation is going to help your use case? So today we are going to see how well, the details about that. So, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Pratap. I'm a solutions architect with AWS. I help partners build on top of AWS, especially AI and ML partners. What is AI? We all know what AI is. I'm not going to be telling you what AI is. But the, I want to mention a subtlety there. There is a general idea of what AI is. Um, there's no specific ex uh, definition for this, but there is a subtlety to the definition, right? We all know that AI is a technology that can uh, do, uh, do a task that usually requires a human being, right? I, I compare that to a little bit to a magic, right? A magic is something that only very special people can do. Uh, maybe Harry Potter or uh, we're in Vegas, so maybe uh, David Copperfield can do. Um, if everybody starts doing this, uh, like let's say if I start doing uh, magic, it, it fails to be magic, it becomes a trick, right? Similarly, you see this in AI as well. What used to be AI 50 years ago, it's no longer considered AI today. Right? A rules engine was considered like pinnacle of AI like 50 years ago. It, it's not even considered an algorithm. So even a few decades er, uh, earlier, what would have been considered as an AI, al, uh, AI is just considered as an algorithm today. That's fine. How does it help us? Today, the forefront of AI is led by a class of algorithms called machine learning. I'm sure you've heard of this as well. Machine learning is a class of algorithms that can learn by itself uh, by reading a lot of data. Even in that, there is a subsection called neural networks. Even in that, the forefront is now with something called deep neural networks. 
Today we will see an example of what are the different kinds of algorithms that may be helpful in security and how to apply them. All right. But why is AI getting so much attention? It's actually almost bothering me that is this a hype cycle? Like, yeah. um, there are some predictions about that. But there is a real reason as to what is driving this craze. The first thing that happened was data. Right? Data, you can now store data very cheaply. Right? S3 is very cheap. Compute. You have now practically infinite amount of compute. Be it instances, now you have GPU-based instances, which, uh, which gives you the extra oomph. And when you have these two available for everybody, a new set of algorithms uh, cropped up. Right? As almost like there is a new uh, class of algorithms are popping up almost on a weekly basis in, in machine learning today. Right? So I hear you. So we have machine learning concepts, which is very general. We understand all what that is. And we have a product, or you have probably have homegrown tools that you have built yourself. Or you probably are using a partner solution today. But you don't, you're not really sure if it's using ML. You, you, you know, probably know that it's not using AI or ML. How do you go from there to using AI and ML? to improve your system, right? In Amazon, we have something called a, called a flywheel for data. It's a process. It's a way to think to help us convert from where we are towards moving towards a target, right? The first thing is first start collecting data, right? Collect as much data as possible. Throw it in S3. Throw it wherever. Once you have the data, you can now start using the big data solutions, right? Um, Hadoop-based algorithms to start getting more and more insights from this data. So once you get some kind of idea of what is going on, what are the patterns in this, then you can start building machine learning algorithms on top of this data. Use these machine learning algorithms uh, to enhance your product. Hopefully, once you have done this, if you're a partner, you, you are going to get more users. Even if you're internal, uh, if you're, you're building internal homegrown, homegrown tools, you're going to start to see more usage of this tool. Right? Once you have that, you're going to be able to collect more data. And the cycle starts. So this flywheel spins faster and faster with each iteration. Right? One example uh, I can give you today is Semantic. Semantic is an advanced tier technology partner. They are also a security competency partner. They collect lots of data. They collect 9 trillion rows of, of data. And for this, they used unsupervised clustering algorithms to cluster the data into buckets. In this way, when they had to sample the data and analyze the data, they did not have to analyze every single data point. But because they clustered them into buckets, this gave the ability to understand or analyze them in groups. And how did this help them? This helped them to, they were able to find 40% more of the low and slow attacks that are, these are sophisticated attacks designed to evade the rules-based engines that is found in most security products. So this is, this is happening today, right? So that's one example of why you should use AI in, in security. What other use cases are there? Let's look at the, the first ones, the, the more fundamental ones. Rules-based engines, right? This is the workhorse of the security industry. I've written rules. Lots of security products have rules, rules engines. Right? Every time there's a new attack, they have these um, uh, um, design PhDs who go and find out what is going on. And they, they try to detect uh, a signature of this attack. And they insert and, and they create new rules. 
right? But the thing is, there are some problems with rules engines in general, right? The first is zero-day attacks. I'm sure you're all security people. You know what zero-day attacks are? Zero-day attacks are the ones that for which we do not have a signature on. So, so you've not created rules on. But there could be, the attack could be in the wild. It could already be spreading, but there could not be, uh, nobody, nobody probably has detected uh, or created a, a rule for this yet. So how is the rules engine going to detect this? The second one is, reason is metamorphic or polymorphic code. These are really crazy. They are inspired from biological processes, if you can imagine. These are attacks or malware that when it jumps from one host to another, they can change themselves. They have code that they modify themselves, and it's, it's somewhat similar to mutation, right? It, it keeps mutating every time it jumps. So what happens is there, it's, it's not possible to get a good signature on these because the signature keeps changing, right? So it's harder to write rules for these. And these were specifically built by the attackers to evade these kinds of rules engines. The other thing is protocol-based obfuscation. That is my favorite because when I was a researcher, I built a tool that did this. Um, so I'll give you an example of what this does. It's, it's quite interesting. I th at least I think it is. <laughs> so I took a known attack and I had commercial grade IPS systems. And I made sure this attack could be detected by these systems. It's actually a very simple attack. And what I did was I applied transformations on that, IP-level transformations, TCP-level transformations, application-level transformations. I wrote this in Prolog. So what, is, what, is I, what do I mean by IP-level transformations? This is really simple. So the attack usually comes in a single packet. The signature learns to read this packet, TCP packet or IP packet, and do a regular expression match. Right? It's a string match at the end of the day. But IP transformation, what this was, I can, I can do something called IP fragmentation, split the packet into two packets and send us two packets, one after another. This made it look like it, it, there, there is a component in an IPS system called normalizer, which is supposed to do all these, uh, normalize all the kinds of transformations, bring it down to canonical form. But when I split this into two packets, the attack was still valid, right? But the IDS or IPS could not detect it. Of course, I failed, I filed a, a bug report for this, and it was fixed at a later point. But there are many kinds of transformations you can apply to evade rules engines. Another interesting, uh, uh, or, or I think you guys probably know this, alert fatigue. I think somebody was, ta I was talking to somebody earlier um, in the hallway. They were talking about how they analyzed 20 alerts in a whole day, uh, but it, none of them were real. So it was a busy day, but it was not very useful, right? If you have too many false positives, uh, that's going to cause alert fatigue, and you will not be having, able to have the energy or the patience to work on the real alerts. The other thing is, we already discussed this, the attackers have already started using AI, right? So we better buck up and start to understand exactly how they are using it, if not at least start to incorporate AI and ML into our security tools. And where are these security tools? What are these tools that we can use? Um, data loss prevention. This is, the, this is I think, is, is a hot topic today. Um, I can, you, you guys know about intrusion detection, fraud detection, this is the standard set. So what I'm trying to convey with this is, you can apply ML to almost any security application, right? Well, I can't talk about all these applications in this talk today. That's gonna be uh, uh, too big of a scope for this talk, but we will talk about data loss prevention, or DLP. Right? What is DLP, data loss prevention? That is, you probably have lots of data. 
You probably are storing this data in S3 or some other place. Now, how do you know who is accessing this? You want to make sure that this data is not stolen and taken out of your domain. You also want to make sure, or worse, this could be held for ransom. We hear about these ransom stories. And important thing to note here is it need not be an outside person doing this. There could be an inside person. So that makes so protecting your data even harder, right? So to be able to effectively um, do data loss uh, DLP, you need three things. You need monitoring. You need user behavior analytics and data classification. So in this talk, what I'll do is I'll try to apply ML and AI and, and fit it into this use case. And you guys can um, take the, uh, the algorithms and the ideas and apply it to any other security use case, right? So these are the three things that you would need at a minimum to have an effective DLP, right? Let's look at each component here. First, monitoring, all right? Let's look at how a monitoring infrastructure architecture looks like on AWS. The first thing that you need to do monitoring is to start collecting logs, right? You have AWS CloudTrail logs, CloudWatch logs, uh, Route 53 logs, uh, VPC flow logs, even application logs, start collecting them, right? The thing is, you throw them in S3. Use EMR, Elastic MapReduce, create an application, uh, a Hadoop-based application or a Spark-based application to process this data in S3. And if you do detect something, you raise alerts. You send out alerts, or you could, do, um, uh, you could create dashboards for viewing the data at least. So this is a very typical uh, monitoring solution, or architecture of a monitoring solution on AWS. Now let's look at how this, we can enhance this monitoring, right? Splunk is a, is a partner in this space. You guys probably know them. They are also an advanced tier partner. Uh, a security competency partner as well. They provide uh, monitoring solutions. They collect uh, logs, and they let you slice and dice the data in, in many different ways. Not just that. They also provide you a platform to write your own code. It could be in Python or it could be in R. And you run these algorithms on the data set that they've collected, and you can come up with your own insights. I hear that one of the customers here is already using that today. Even better, they provide inbuilt ML algorithms already, especially anomaly detection algorithms. I mentioned anomaly here, right? What is, so that's, that brings us to the part, like that is the problem you're gonna hit using machine learning, all right? For us to understand this, um, we need to understand first what exactly anomaly is, but then that's not a single thing. First of all, anomaly is not a single thing. There is no single definition. There are multiple definitions of what an anomaly is. But we will go with this definition that's popular in the security space, that is um, any signal, anything that does not conform to previously observed patterns, right? That's, that's somewhat vague, but, but that does the trick, right? But let's see in what kind of vagueness it gives us, right? The vagueness comes in patterns, right? One dimensional signal, right? It's a, it's a real number that's updated uh, periodically, right? I'm sure you guys all can see the anomaly here. There is the value of the signal stays at around 10 most of the time, and there is a sudden spike at time t equals 200. Fairly easy to understand. Now think about the way and how to implement an anomaly detection algorithm for this, right? I could write a moving average 
and find that the moving average is at 10, and suddenly it spikes up, and then it's, it, it, if, I, if the value goes up by several standard deviations, I can say, hey, I want to mark it as anomaly. Not so fast, right? The spike is in the positive direction. What was in the negative direction? You need to handle that as well. Well, here is another story. I have two kids. Can I tell a story? I, I have two kids. So when, before I was uh, leaving for Vegas, um, um, there was like, they always make a lot of noise. Like, it's, it's impossible to live there. I don't know how I live there, but they're screaming their guts all the time. They're always fighting, making too much noise, right? Um, but about five o'clock, the house was suddenly silent. Like, it's, it's like pin drop silence. And I, I was very happy, but then my wife said, that's not good. That's, that's really bad. You know, that's when, that's when they were not in, in our sights and they were doing something really naughty. That's when they don't make any sense and they're, they, they collude with each other. And, and so if a, if a signal goes to zero, that is also an anomaly there, right? My, my wife was able to detect the anomaly. Obviously, I could not in that scenario. So you have to capture that as well. It's not just how far of a signal is going. Uh, so that's, that's, there's, that's a kind of uh, anomaly detector you would use there. Right? Now let's look at a more complicated uh, uh, scenario. Can you apply the same algorithm for this kind of a signal? Right? The signal here has a pattern, a cyclical pattern. Right? It, does the signal continuously stays within the threshold, so your threshold algorithm would fail? So a, a data point that does not fit into the cyclical pattern would be tag, should be tagged as an anomaly here. So what, what, is, what is needed here? So anomaly detection algorithm should be able to understand the cyclical pattern and be able to tell if it's gone off the pattern. This is a screenshot I took from Datadog. This is another uh, security partner. Um, uh, security competency partner as well. Even worse, nobody works on single signals, right? You have hundreds of signals, uh, thousands of signals coming from various different systems. I, I'm just showing you five signals here. It's not much. And, and I think there, are, there may be some cycles here. I'm not sure. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is all the complexity of the previous anomaly still stays. At the same time, your dimension just went up five times. Right? Five is nothing. But, but another thing that you notice that the anomaly, uh, it's no longer obvious to the human eye as to whether there is an anomaly here or not. I, I, there, you could say there is an anomaly, but I'm not really sure. Right? So that is why you need to have a definition of really clamp down what your anomaly is in this scenario. And there are lots and lots of scenarios. For example, we only saw uh, real numbers in the signals. What if there are user IDs? What if there are IP addresses? What if there are um, other kinds of data? What if there's text in this data? How are you going to detect anomalies? There are literally thousands of anomaly detection algorithms to solve each of these kinds of problems. Obviously, I'm not going to go over each of them. But we will, I, I'm going to pick a few because they have uh, caught the attention of folks. They are uh, really radical, radically new ideas on how to detect anomalies. One of the cool new things, uh, new uh, discoveries was using, or I should say even a trick, is to use NLP for security. NLP is the uh, super specialization field within machine learning, which deals with natural language. So this is natural language processing. Natural language is uh, human languages, like English, French, and Chinese, and so on. The, the, this field grew separately. There was no combination with, with security. And they have built, they had their own set of problems that they were trying to solve. And they have built algorithms that suits that use case. 
what they found recently was that they could take those algorithms and apply it to network traffic, which is kind of, I think it's radical, right? So for example, you have words in the language, like apple, orange, right? In network traffic, you have these atomic actions, like uh, HTTP get request. That's an atomic action. You have phrases, right, like eat an apple. Similarly, in uh, security, you could have a sequence of events that, act, uh, that happen. Now is the trick, right? The algorithms can read text, read these phrases, put these things together, and it can actually learn a, the grammar of a language without a human being ever telling it what a verb is or what a noun is. It does this all by itself. And similarly, it can build what they applied, when they applied this to network traffic, they found that it could also build a grammar of sorts. A grammar is, if you can think, it's an abstract a rule set, right? We have grammar, like verbs and nouns, and you have to use it in a certain way. And they were able to apply the same logic to this, same algorithms to this. And if you notice, the anomaly in English language, we, uh, as human beings, we can detect it um, real fast. For example, when I say, how is you, right? You know that there is a grammatical mistake there, I and mean, we should have said, how are you? That's a, that's a, there, is a, there was a, um, a grammatical mistake there, and you were able to, I'm sure you were able to detect it immediately, right? What if you can detect this? By the way, did you understand that this anomaly it's also a very different kind of anomaly than before, right? What we're seeing were real numbers, right? Just going up and down or cyclical patterns. This is a much higher order of anomaly, where this is the real kind of anomaly where when an attack happens and you're seeing a, a stream of packets go out or something of that sort, and you, based on what it is understood, now you know that, hey, this set of sequence of uh, events should not be happening. It's not in my grammar, right? That is the benefit of using NLP for this. They were successfully able to do this, right? That's, that's one category. I want to go over just one more algorithm before we jump back to security use case, right? This is my favorite. This is the uh, cutting edge of anomaly detection. What I've shown here is a neural network, um, a special one called a replicatable neural network. It's a, it's a representative of that. It's not the exact one. The gray circles represent neurons, and the gray lines represent connections between the neurons. The input comes to the, from the left. So the neurons that receive the input is called input neurons. And as the signal propagates through the network, it exits and the output neurons are on to the right. So it propagates through the network and comes out. The special, this is, this is a normal neural network, right? What is special about a replicator neural network is that you expect the output to be the same as the input. It's kind of weird, right? Why would you expect this to just replicate whatever I just said? Doesn't make any sense. But it's, there is a brilliance to this. What it's trying to do is, it's trying to make the neural network remember what it said. I'll, I'll try to make it intuitive for you guys, right? Let's say you are going to give me 100 words, and I am the neural network, and I have to remember this, I'm gonna give it back to you. And I'm supposed to remember this and tell it to you again. Now imagine the, let's say, the, the, the sequence you've been telling me, sequence of words, is always a story, right? And am I going to remember every single word that you said? No, because that's very inefficient. I can't remember 100 words. What I would remember is, I would just remember the story or the events that happened the story, and then try to create the story when I say it back to you, right? I'm kind of replicating what you said. Now, what I did there was to compress the words into a bunch of events and then push it back to you in, in, and uh, recreate the, the words for you, right? So in essence, that's what we're trying to do here. 
when we have squeezed the middle. If you notice, the central, uh, the hidden layers has only two neurons. The two neurons means that it has lesser number of dimensions than the input neuron. The input neuron had three neurons. Right? Now it's forced to compress this knowledge into a new, two neurons. And then again, the output neurons is going to match with the front. Now imagine the case, again, let's get back to my, my test. Right? So you gave me 100 words, and I give it back to you. Right? And you gave me a nice story. I'm able to reproduce that story to you. What if you don't give me a story and just give me a random set of words? Do you think I, sh I can? Remember that and give it back to you. I will not be able to remember that because I have to remember every single word individually. Right? I cannot reduce that 100 words into a nice short form, uh, just a sequence of like five or six events, and I cannot replicate that. I have to remember every single word. Now, that is what is detected as an anomaly. Right? So if I am unable to remember what I, what I was told, I'm not able to replicate it. And that is tagged as an anomaly. Right? That's the exact same intuition here. It, it does three interesting things. This is, th this is the only slide I'm going to talk about neural networks. Don't worry. Now, now the interesting thing is this, this actually does some uh, cool things. It has three advantages. One is this can scale linearly with the number of signals. Right? Uh, in other, other algorithms, that's a problem. If you, have, if you increase the dimensions, if you increase the number of signals, um, it becomes computationally very inefficient, whereas this does not slow down. Number two, an artificial, this neural network can identify any kind of patterns. You don't have to specify that it has to be a cyclical pattern or it has to be a, a pattern of a certain kind. This is a general purpose uh, uh, replicated neural network. It can remember any kind of pattern. Right? Now, the third thing is this can do it in near real time. Right? This can be real fast. Well, we talked about five different kinds of anomalies and, and, um, and algorithms that can be applied to different scenarios. Let's see, I mean, the world is not so great. After all, there are some challenges even now. Right, let's look at each of them and see which ones uh, affect us and what kind of impact it has on your algorithm. Okay? Anomalous does not mean it's malicious. Right? An anomaly is just that, hey, I've, I've not seen this kind of a data before. Something new is happening. Maybe it's genuinely new. It does, maybe, you've never, it's not, maybe we have not, the system may not have seen it. But does not mean it's malicious. However, we cannot let go of it, right? We have to analyze every single data point that is tagged as anomalous. So that is, that is still the case. Lack of normal data. This is becoming more of a problem because for you to train the most awesome neural network, they, they require lots and lots of data. The neural network always requires, especially deep neural networks, Deep neural network means it has more and more layers. That's the only difference. It needs uh, even more data. It's very data hungry. Right? But getting a lot of normal data is very difficult. Right? Because you have to get it from your environment. Right? My environment may not be the same as your environment. Normalcy poisoning. This is interesting. I'm going to tell you another story what, to, to help you understand what normalcy poisoning is. It's a cool sounding word. Right? I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Right? Every month, every, every two months, we have earthquakes, like because it's in a fault line. Um, we get at least small tremors. Well, if the big one comes, uh, I'm gone. But uh, we, <laughs> we, we do get tremors like uh, once in two to three months, I think. Uh, I used to like, uh, watch out for these. Like in Twitter, you can, it, I actually have a Twitter feed where they send out when there is a tremor. But um, I stopped following that. Uh, um, I mean, I don't even really care. Because the anomalous event has happened too often, my idea of what a normal, normal life has changed. 
I mean, San Francisco people are different in many ways, but this is, if you ask a person from a different part of the country where they don't see an earthquake, if they hear that there's a tremor, they're going to panic, right? Uh, well, we don't panic because our no, the idea of normalcy has changed. So this is similar to this as well. We can apply that same here. If an anomalous event happens too often, um, it is not going to be considered anomalous anymore. Right? No matter what kind of algorithm you use, this is a, this is a persistent problem. Euclidean distance measure is expensive. What does Euclidean distance measure mean? Um, Euclidean distance measure means that I have a signal, um, I have another signal. Now I want to make a comparison between these two signals and find out um, what is the difference. Let's say these are two data points, I need to measure the distance between that. Are they too close to each other or are they far apart? Now, you need to understand how different they are to be able to tell whether they're anomalous, right? If, if the distance is zero or if it's small, it means that it's, it's, it's on the same uh, space. Um, that is relatively easy to do when the dimensions are low. Like if you have a one dimensional signal, I mean, it's just a, uh, there's a single operation there. What if you have a signal that has like, thousands of features, right? That kind of distance measure between two signals with very high dimensionality is very expensive, uh, computationally expensive. So that means that it's going to have some kind of a compromise uh, to, to avoid getting into that uh, bottleneck, right? But we did see how on a, a replicated neural network does not have this problem. It's hard to fine tune. It's really hard to fine tune because every environment is different. My environment, my VPC has different components than yours. Um, I see different kind of traffic than yours. Almost no environment is the same, right? So um, the, what is normal for me may not be normal for you, or what is normal for you may not be normal for me. So you have to train it on your own data. And that makes it even harder to fine tune, okay? Now let's get back to our security use case, right? We saw monitoring. The second pillar of uh, data loss prevention is a user behavior an analysis. You probably heard this term before uh, if you're in the security space. Um, let's look at that, how, how, how it's used in security, right? Traditional systems use SAEM, security and information management systems. That's the traditional uh, way to collect data. Now, the UBA, or user behavior analytics, is a, is a very different way to look at the data. The, let me go over the, the differences between the two. What does SIEM do? It looks at a system, let's say it's an instance, right? It looks at that system and it monitors the logs, it monitors the IP addresses it receives, and it looks at that system, right? Whereas UBA, it does not do that. It tracks users, user IDs and how this person goes around. SIEM follows system events, right? In a, in a single instance, it follows the, the pattern of events that are happening and understands what is happening there, right? Whereas in a UBA, you try to understand how a user behaves, right? Not, no, you don't, you don't, you're not stuck to a single system. A user might be going around and doing certain things. And so SIEM helps you find anomalies in the systems whereas an, uh, uh, UBA helps you find anomalies uh, with user behavior, right? I can give you an example, again, another story. This is a true story. This happened uh, just 24 hours ago. Uh, obviously, I'm from San Francisco. Um, I, I'm, I just flew in, I think, uh, yesterday. I go, went in to purchase, make a purchase, right? I, I got an email saying from my credit card company saying that, hey, we saw an, an anomalous transaction because they were tracking my usage that they knew that I, was, uh, I, w I live in San Francisco area and I always make certain purchases. Suddenly, my usage is different and I'm making a purchase in uh, Las Vegas. So this turned out to be a difference in suddenly anomalous behavior for my credit card. So they were tracking my usage, my credit card usage. As opposed to SAEM would be if they track a single merchant, 
Let's say there's a shopkeeper, and uh, they, they always keep tracking about the, tracking the transactions that this shopkeeper is making to find out whether there are any fraudulent transactions or not. Maybe they can identify kinds of merchants who do certain kinds of transactions and, and tag them. So that's the key difference. It's not one versus the other. It's more about uh, they complement each other. It's better to use both so that it catches different kinds of fraud. Or in fraud systems, it's, it's fraud detection. Here, it's anomaly detection. It's the same thing. Okay, that's UBA. Now, let's look at data classification. Right? This is probably the most important piece where we use both monitoring and UBA within this. Why do you need data classification? Um, Imagine you are a large company, right? If you're a large enterprise, you have hundreds of employees, and let's say your employees have been given access to S3, and they can upload whatever files they want, access whatever files they want. And as an administrator, now you want to have some kind of control as to what kind of data is uploaded. You, and you have made a data classification scheme saying that a policy saying that nobody uploads usernames and passwords in a text file. Nobody upload code to S3, right? That's your company's rules. Now, how do you monitor this, right? How do you monitor this? Because uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, hey, I will look at the ex file extension of the file name, um, .txt or, or .c for a C file or .py for a Python file. Well, if, if you have a, an attacker internal to your system, uh, the first thing they're going to do is change the file names. So that's not going to be a very effective way to detect um, the uh, classification of the data. Obviously, you need to look into the data and see what kind of data is in there. Now, when you look into the data, the, the next step that I, that, that's obvious to me is, okay, I have certain files that I do not want them to upload. So maybe I, and I want to detect especially uh, files that contain credentials, right? Uh, usernames and password. First thing comes to mind is I can write a regular expression, a rule to catch this, right? Let's say that is how a user would upload it. That is my name and that is not a real password. I just uh, typed it randomly. And I want to detect these kinds of files getting uploaded into S3, right? Uh, that's a regular expression that can catch it. So I'm looking for the keyword username, right? If I find the username a keyword, I want to say, hey, this is a file that should not be there, right? Uh, but uh, but I'm, I don't want to, I not always do a right username. I might say, uh, I might say user, right? Now you're, it no longer fits your rule, right? It has evaded your rule. So you have to apply, up, uh, you have to change your rule now, like maybe something like this, where you're trying to catch user. Know that you also need to catch the previous example, right? Well, I might have saved a file like this, like say U and P, right? Uh, now that is yet another change to my regular expression. Well, I just may not even have a keyword, right? Like that is the, that is the best kind of uh, regular expression I can write to catch that. Obviously, that regular expression just means that it matches all text. Not very useful, but it drives home the point that writing rules is a very time-consuming process. It's also very buggy. It's easy to uh, in, uh, insert bugs into your rules. The other thing is it's also easy to evade rules, right? So that is why you need to use machine learning to uh, use uh, to classify data, especially natural language processing, right? It's known for this. So Amazon Macy is a service that helps you classify the data in S3, all right? It uses NLP to classify the data, right? Instead of rules, they have written, uh, trained the algorithms to take certain kinds of text and it uses UBA to predict user patterns. Right? How does Amazon Macy work? Um, you can actually imagine how it works. So first thing is it collects logs. 
events from CloudTrail and other, other sources, right? It also collects information about users accessing it. And when it has these two both, what it tries to do is it tries to cluster uh, the events and users together and creates user groups, right? Let's say you have a large S3 bucket and you have multiple uh, objects in your bucket and you have uh, many employees with different roles, right? So once it sees certain pattern in its access, what it's trying to see is, okay, um, I see certain users, they look like administrators and they have certain properties and they behave in a certain way. And let's say, and then I have developers, right? And they behave in a certain way, they access certain files in a certain way. And then you have marketing people, they access uh, the, the certain files in a certain way. So it tries to cluster them into user groups and it then learns their behavior, like what are the kinds of files they, they, um, they access, right? What are they supposed to do? What are they not supposed to do? Once that is done, that is, that is UBA, right? User Behavior Analytics. Once that is done, now they, they were there, when you have a, a anomalous access, you now have uh, the ability to raise alert. It would raise an alert. In addition, it also provides you a narrative as to what exactly happened. That is, it would say that this was a user, this behavior was supposed to be like this, and this is what happened, this is considered anomaly. Right, so it would raise alerts. We have customers today using this, um, admins, Netflix, and Autodesk, um, a few customer references here. And they use it for compliance, um, as well as to monitor the S3, right? So I'm going over this quickly. So here are a few more partners um, that use AI and ML today to solve many security problems. Right? Many of them are in the competency. Uh, they are very cool. They, uh, you can, they, some of them are for threat collection, uh, some of them for uh, monitoring, and so on. Feel free to take a look at it afterwards. Right? But let's say, now, now that you know a little bit about uh, anomaly detection and certain classes of algorithms, um, I hope that that helps you get uh, an idea of what kind of algorithms to use for different kinds of use cases. But let's say you, uh, you want to use, so there, if you want to build your own application, your own uh, machine learning algorithms, right? We let you do that on AWS. You have all the tools that you need within AWS to do this. For example, we, and we, we classify the services um, in tiers, right? And the top tier is what we call services. AI services, these are prepackaged services that uses machine learning underneath to provide you a certain functionality. Um, uh, recognition, Poly, Lex, and Amazon Macy, of course, right, that uses machine learning underneath. These are prepackaged services. You don't get to access the machine learning models themselves, right, used as either as from the console or using the API. Right? But let's say you're not happy with this. You want some more flexibility. You want to build your own models. So for that, we have a certain, certain number of platforms. Amazon Machine Learning uh, Service um, and EMR. So Amazon Machine Learning Service lets you upload data, and it will build a model for you, and you will have access to the model. Um, EMR is Elastic MapReduce. You can write your own Hadoop or Spark applications and submit this as a job, and that will do the job for you. It will give you the model. Let's say you're not happy with this. You want some more flexibility because the platforms are opinionated in a certain way. It's built in a certain way. You want even more flexibility, and you want to explore even more engines. So we have uh, Amazon Deep Learning uh, Army, which is uh, using which you can launch it on an EC2 instance with, uh, with a lot of CPU, or you can use it on uh, P2 or P3 instances with GPUs. And this army supports most of the popular engines um, or deep learning frameworks out there, like MXNet, TensorFlow, Cafe, Torch, Tiano, you name the list. It also comes with Python, Jupyter, et cetera. So with this, you should be able to do anything that you want, build your own models or use predefined models or use a platform to make it easy for you or just use the services that we already have, or use our partner solutions, right? So that is 
uh, what you, you get from being in Amazon. And I hope I gave you some ideas on what the uh, algorithms that are relevant to security. I know it's only a small sliver, but you can apply it to build your own models or even use it to see which of your partner uh, technologies are applicable to your use case. All right, thank you.